Hello and welcome to Wemke's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. We shall continue on our electrocardiography week. These are a series of lectures that are aimed at getting you from being confused as a medical practitioner or a student to being a professional at how to interpret the ECG. In the previous lecture, we looked at the rhythm of the heart, and in these next two lectures, we're going to be looking at abnormalities of the P wave, the curious complex, and the T waves. So in this review lecture video, we'll look at abnormalities of the P wave and the curious complex, and then in the subsequent lecture, we'll look at abnormalities of the T wave as well as the ST segment, and that is how we shall end these review lecture videos, after which I shall give you a reminder of the important things that we have covered over the past week. We shall then um, look at uh, different questions that I shall set later on and release a link that will advise the subscribers of the channel to take the test after you've watched the ECG channel, then give individuals time to think through the questions and actually learn how to read the ECG. and. Just like that, we shall post the answers a bit later on after we get some responses from the viewers. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe, hit the bell notification to get um, the bell icon. I don't know why I say notification. Hit the bell icon to get uh, notifications every time I post such a video. Remember that whenever you're interpreting your ECG, you first want to identify the rhythm. So you ask yourself, are there any abnormalities of the P waves? Uh, what is the cardiac axis? When we're looking at the cardiac axis, please look at lead 1, lead 2, lead 3, as well as lead AVF. First start off by comparing lead 1 with lead AVF. If they are both facing the same direction upwards, then that's a normal cardiac axis. If lead 1 and lead 3 are also facing up, that's a normal cardiac axis. Then if lead 1 is facing downwards, then lead 3 and lead AVF are facing upwards, then that's a right axis deviation. Then if lead 1 is facing upwards, lead 3 and lead AVF are facing downwards, Words, we don't still call that a right axis deviation. It only becomes, I mean, a left axis deviation. It only becomes significant if lead two is also facing downwards. So that's a left axis deviation. So remember, all good thumbs up, right uh, reaches, left leaves. If you don't know what that means, please refer, or that what that means, please refer to the earlier videos. And then we also go and look at the curious complex and ask ourselves if it's, if it's of normal duration, one, two, three small squares. And are there any abnormalities that we can see with the curious complex in particular? Do we see any abnormal Q waves? We will talk about what Q waves are a bit later on. We look at the ST segment and we ask ourselves, is it raised or is it depressed? We look at the T waves and ask ourselves, are they normal? Are they peaked? Are they inverted? So remember um, that the P waves could either be normal unusually tall or unusually broad. So those are the uh, connotations that we could have or the possibilities that we'd have of the P wave. And then we look at the curious complex, you could have three possibilities. It could be too broad, it could be too tall, or it could also contain an abnormal Q wave. Then we look at the SE segment, it could be normal, it could be elevated, or it could be depressed. Then we look at the T waves, the could be upright, they could be peaked, or they could be inverted. Then you could also have additional waves, such as a U wave, which I'll talk about at the end of the next video. So we'll begin with abnormalities of the P wave. So remember that apart from alterations of the shape of the P wave associated with the rhythm change, there are also two other important abnormalities. And these abnormalities are, are going to be relating to hypertrophy of the atrium. So anything that is going to be putting strain on the right atrium will cause the right atrium to hypertrophy. So it could be pathologies such as tricuspid valve stenosis, it could be pulmonary hypertension, and whenever there is this, there is going to be a peaked P wave. Then and you could sometimes have a left uh, atrial hypertrophy, meaning anything putting strain on the left atrium will cause the left atrium to hypertrophy. So this is going to result in a, a broad and a bifid P wave, which we call P mitrale. The P wave that you get from um, pulmonary condition, you refer to that as P pulmonale. So remember that the atrial, the atrial hypertrophy will usually diagnose this by looking at the contour of the P wave, which is obviously best seen in lead two. And remember that the depolarization of the uh, P wave or the depolarization of the atrium pretty much is symbolized by the P wave. But remember that the impulse is starting off from the right 
atrium because the SA node is in the right atrium, then obviously spreading to the left atrium. So it means that the initial part of the P wave is contributed by the right atrium. Then the later, the later part of the P wave is contributed by the left atrium. So here's a diagram to show you this. So this initial part, which is not shaded, is contributed by the right atrium. Then this part, which is shaded, is contributed for by the left atrium. So with right ventricular, uh, right atrial hypertrophy rather, um, there's going to be a very prominent uh, initial component such that the P waves are going to be up here peaked. Now these P waves are only considered peaked if they are greater than two and a half squares. So one small square, two small squares, a half small square. So if they are uh, greater than two and a half more small squares, then you refer to these as peaked. They're usually a feature of right atrial hypertrophy. And this is associated with pulmonary hypertension. And these type of P waves are referred to as P pulmonale. So here's an example of a peaked um, P wave. If you can't see this very uh, well, I shall leave the link description with all the ECG presentations where you could actually visit the Dropbox in the description below. Here is another ECG of a peaked um, P wave or P pulmonale. Here's another description of a, a peaked um, P wave or P pulmonale, of course, in right atrial hypertrophy. Then moving on to left atrial hypertrophy, um, remember that the second component of the P wave is pretty much going to be due to the left um, uh, atrium. And because the impulse is supposed to spread over and depolarize the left atrium, but now you need a much greater impulse to depolarize this uh, hypertrophied part, so you get a delayed as well as a prominent uh, P wave, so it becomes widened. So you get widening of the P wave, and it's greater than two and a half squares. So as you can see, one two this is almost three squares and it appears to be notched so it's kind of like appears like the p wave has an m so you refer to this as a p mitrale because it's common in mitral disease so here is an example of p mitrale as you can see here we can also see here here is a, a much subtle one okay but as you can see the p wave is, is um broad so here's an ECG with a notched P wave that is obviously indicating of left atrial hypertrophy. So this should be quite straightforward. Sometimes you may get a biatrial hypertrophy where the P waves are, are both tall, they are notched as, they are, as well as broad. So you see that in biatrial hypertrophy. So they are taller than two and a half small squares. They're also broader than two and a half small squares. Then we move on to abnormalities that are affecting the QRS complex. So remember that the normal QRS complex has these four characteristics. So number one, it is not greater than three small squares. So meaning that it's not greater than 120 milliseconds in duration. Number two, remember that um, the right ventricle is represented by V1, and in V1, the S wave is greater than the R wave. We discussed this, I think, in the previous lectures. Then in the left ventricle, this is going to be manifested by V5 and V6. And remember that the height of the R wave should be less than 25 centimeters, or 25 millimeters rather. Then in the left ventricular leads, there may be um, some Q waves which are due to depolarization of the septum. So you may get um, a Q wave in the left ventricular leads, but these Q waves should be less than one millimeter across and they should be less than two millimeters deep. If they are greater than this, then they are pathological. Then abnormalities of the width of the curious complex. Remember that curious complexes are abnormally wide if there is a bundle branch block or when the depolarization focuses happens to be in the ventricular muscle, as for example, in ventricular escape beats. So in either case, there's going to be an increase in the width um, of the QRS complex indicated that there's an abnormal and a slower pathway of conduction. Then you may sometimes get an increase in the QRS complex. So this increase in the QRS complex, it means that the mass of the ventricle has increased. So it means that you need more voltage or more current or electrical activity to actually depolarize this ventricle. So it means that the height of the QRS complex will be much taller. So remember that in ventricular hypertrophy, we usually diagnose it by recognizing the pattern that we see from the V1 to V6, so pretty much the RS progression. So remember that the S wave in the right-sided 
chest leads, you uh, usually tends to disappear as you come from V1 where there is an S wave and then up to V2 where it progressively uh, decreases. And then somewhere around V4, there's usually an equal R wave as well as an equal S wave. And then of course the R wave progressively increases from V1 where it is small to V6 where it is quite large so that's no, known as a normal RS progression so as you can see here you have your S wave here that I mean R so Q R you have your R wave here which is progressively increasing here then you have your S wave here which is progressively decreasing so we'll begin now by talking about left ventricular hypertrophy, then we'll, look, we'll go to right ventricular hypertrophy, then we'll look at biventricular hypertrophy. So remember that in left ventricular hypertrophy, the pattern, the RS progression that we have is normal. The only thing that is going to be changing in this case is the amplitude. Because the left ventricle has hypertrophied, so there is much greater uh, depolarization that has to take place. So usually, the leads that you're going to be looking at um, that are going to point you towards left ventricular hypertrophy are pretty much leads V1 and V2. Then we also um, look at V6. So in left ventricular hypertrophy, you get a deep S wave in lead V1 and V2. The RS waves are equal in V3, which is pretty much normal, and they are very tall in lead V5 and V6. So you compare V1 and V2 as well as V5 and V6. So usually we measure the amplitude of the S wave in V1 and V2, which happens to be larger. So if the amplitude in um, lead V1 of the S wave is greater than 25 millimeter, then you make a diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy. If the um, R wave in V6 is greater than 25 millimeters, then you make a diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy. Or if you add the height of the S wave in V1 with um, the height of the uh, R wave in V6, if that is greater than 35 millimeters, then you make a diagnosis of left ventricular hypertrophy. So usually left ventricular hypertrophy is also going to be associated with left axis deviation. It, you may also see a P mitrale, which is like a broad um, or a notched P wave. And usually we see this in lead two. And if they significant hypertrophy, usually we may also see inversion of the T waves, especially in leads one, lead AVF, lead V5, V6, and sometimes even lead V4. So here is what is happening. As you can see here, you have lead V1, V2, V3, V4, V5, V6. So as you can see here, the S wave here, that is in um, lead V1. Okay, the S wave that is here in lead V1 is m greater than 25 um, millimeters. So that's 25 small boxes. And then as we can see, the R wave that is in V5 and V6 is also greater than 25 millimeters. Then if we add these, they should be greater than 35 millimeters. Then we make a diagnosis of right um, or left ventricular hypertrophy. So here's an ECG of left ventricular hypertrophy. In this ECG, there is normal sinus rhythm. So by now, you should be able to know how to check for that. There is a normal cardiac axis. You should also be able to know how to check for that. But I want you to focus on leads um, V1 here. As you can see, you have these deep S waves that are present in um, lead um, V1. Then, of course, you have these tall R waves that are present in. Uh, lead V5 as well as V6. Then of course you get some T wave inversion that is happening in lead 1. Over here you get some T wave inversion that is um, also happening in lead V5. You get some T wave inversion that is happening also in lead V6. So this is left ventricular hypertrophy. Then with right ventricular hypertrophy, usually the pattern of the QRS complexes or the RS progression usually changes. So in V1 and V2, instead of you having an uh, S wave, you get a prominent R wave. And then in leads V3 and V4, you get a similar pattern with the equal R S waves. And then in lead V5, you get a deep S wave. And then in lead six, uh, V6, you get a prominent S wave. So it's like the the whole thing is reversed so 
you you should suspect that there's right ventricular hypertrophy if the R wave in the V1 is greater than seven millimeter, or the S wave in V6 is uh, greater than seven millimeter, or the combination of the V1 R wave as well as the V6 S wave is greater than ten millimeters. Um, so right ventricular hypertrophy sometimes may be associated with right axis deviation, or you may see P pulmonale because of right ventricular hypertrophy, so peaked P waves. So as we can see here. Here you get this which is taller than seven millimeter in lead v1 and then you get this which is uh, deeper than seven millimeters in v6 then the addition obviously should be greater than uh, 10 millimeters so here is a severe right um, ventricular hypertrophy so as again this is a normal sinus rhythm there is right axis deviation so you should be able to determine this so when we look at lead v1 you get this very tall uh, or dominant r waves that we can see in lead v1 then in v6 over here we get these um uh, dominant uh, s waves that we can see here so if we add this and this it is much greater than um you 10 millimeters and then you may also see some t-wave inversion like for example here the t-wave inversion is seen in lead um three over here it's seen in lead avf it's also seen in lead v1 it's seen in lead v2 it's seen in lead v3 um v4 not so much uh, but lead v1 v2 and v3 it's pretty obvious so this is um obviously right ventricular hypertrophy so sometimes you may get some strain patterns that may be seen in uh, ventricular hypertrophy. This make hypertrophy um, and ST segment changes very difficult to uh, distinguish. But remember that ventricular enlargement is of two types. You could have dilatation where you get an enlargement without muscle hypertrophy, or you could have hypertrophy, which is usually the muscle increases due to working against resistance. So what you see with the strain pattern that is associated with um, a left foot ventricular hypertrophy is sometimes you may get these tall R waves like we already talked about in lead V5 and V6. You may get a slight depression of the ST segment and of course T wave inversion. So those T wave inversions I'll show you in the previous uh, diagrams that was because of um, a strain pattern that's going to be associated with this ventricular hypertrophy. Here is a right uh, ventricular hypertrophy with a strain pattern. Uh, that you can see over there, of, of course, the depressed uh, ST segment as well as the inverted T wave, in addition to the changes that we talked about with right ventricular hypertrophy. So, uh, take note that if you have a biventricular hypertrophy, you may get features of right ventricular hypertrophy as well as features of left ventricular hypertrophy on the ECG. So, everything we've talked about combined, and you have your biventricular hypertrophy. Then moving on to pulmonary embolism. So remember that the ECG with pulmonary embolism is going to be pointing you towards right ventricular hypertrophy. And in many cases, you may um, not see any abnormalities aside a sinus tachycardia. But of course, remember, we treat the patient, not the ECG. So if this person has features of pulmonary embolism, please treat them like they have pulmonary embolism. So what may mean, what, what we my english jesus what may we see on the ecg you may see peaked p waves you may see right axis deviation you may see tall r waves in lead v1 you may see right bundle bunch block you may see inverted t waves in lead one that may spread of course to lead v2 and v3 sorry this was v1 then you may also get a shift of the transition point to the left such that you get these r waves that are equal in amplitude to the s wave in v5 and v6 remember we normally get them in v3 and v4 and then you may also get a deep s wave in lead of v6 these are patterns that are pointing you towards right ventricular hypertrophy Sometimes you may get a Q wave in lead, uh, in lead three that may resemble an inferior infarction. So take note that, like I said, do not hesitate to treat the patient clinically if uh, it's showing pulmonary embolism. Then if you're in doubt, please treat the patient with an anticoagulant, treat the patient and not the ECG. Then moving on to the Q waves. Q waves are just simply this due to um, the changes that are happening in the septum. So remember that these small septal uh, Q waves in left ventricular hypertrophy result from depolarization of the septum. That's happening from the left to the right side. 
then the Q waves are greater than uh, one uh, um, a, squ a small square in width, so they are about 40 millimeters, and uh, Q waves that are greater than two millimeters in depth you think of them as being significant. So if they're greater than one small squares in width or they are deeper than uh, two millimeters or uh, two small squares in depth, then consider them as significant. So remember that the ventricles are usually depolarized from the inside going outwards. And if you place an electrode that is looking at the cavity of the ventricle, you would actually record a Q wave um, because all the depolarization waves will be moving away from it. So usually if someone, for example, has a myocardial infarction that has caused uh, the muscles uh, within the surface of the heart on the inside of the heart to actually die, then you create what is known as an electric window. And in this electric window, then the electrode can actually look at the heart over the window and it will actually record a Q wave in this area. So it will give you an indication that there's a problem on the inside at this aspect. So if you get these Q waves that are greater than one small square in width or, or two millimeters in depth, and uh, these are going to be indicating an MI, a myocardial infarction. And the leads in which the Q wave actually going to be appearing are going to be some indication of which part is going to be affected. Like for example, if you get this pathological uh, Q waves in the leads that are looking at the heart um, inferiorly or looking at the anterior wall of the heart then usually it leads like v3 v4 even v5 may give you like an anterior left uh, side of the heart that's where the infarct would be and then if they are looking at it from an inferior uh, surface then it would be um, of course lead avf if you are looking at it, um, if the infection is anterior as well as lateral, it could be that it's present in the leads V3 and V4 and also present uh, on the lateral leads such as lead 1, lead AVL and lead V5 and V6. And of course, like I told you, if the infection is anterior surface of the heart, then the Q waves will be seen in. Uh, the leads below lead um, 3 and lead AVF. And if it's now in the posterior wall of the left ventricle, then you get a different pattern. So remember that the right ventricle usually occupies the front of the heart. Anatomically, if the patient is in an anatomical position, normally the depolarization of the, lat of the um, right ventricle is going to be moving towards V1. So this is usually going to be overshadowed by depolarization of the left ventricle which moves away from V1. So the result in this is that you're going to be getting a dominant S wave in lead V1. Then if the infarction is of the posterior wall of the left ventricle, then the depolarization of the right ventricle is less op uh, opposed uh, by the left ventricle. So this is going to be forcing it to become more obvious. And instead of you getting a dominant S wave, you're going to be getting a dominant R wave in the V1. That would now point you towards the posterior wall left ventricular infarct. And the same appearances of the ECG is similar to that of right ventricular hypertrophy, though you may not even have any other changes of right ventricular hypertrophy if you get a posterior wall um, MI of the left ventricle. And remember that the presence of a Q wave does not give any indication of the age of the infarct. Generally, if someone has an infarct, they'll have these Q waves and they'll be there permanently. So here's an ECG of a patient that had an acute myocardial infarction, probably an old um, anterior infarct. So as you can see, this person has a normal uh, sinus rhythm. And if we look at lead three here, we have these pathological Q waves that are present. These small pathological Q waves that are present in lead three. They are also present in lead two. I think you can even see them here in lead two. They are also present in lead AVF, as you can see them in lead AVF. Remember, they should, um, the criteria that uh, we talked about of these, uh, they, sh they are width and they are length, two millimeters and one millimeter. Then there's um, uh, an ST segment elevation that we can see in lead V2, obviously V3, V4, and V5. Then, of course, there's inversion of the T wave that is happening in the three over here, as well as lead AVF. Here is an uh, acute anterolateral myocardial infarction. Again, there's a normal sinus rhythm. Here there's left axis deviation. So um, lead one is facing upwards, 
lead 3 is facing predominantly downwards and lead AVF is facing predominantly downwards. And we can see these pathological Q waves, especially in lead uh, v, uh, AVL. You can also see them in lead V3, like that. You can see them in lead V3. Then, of course, you uh, get some ST segment elevation that is happening in lead 1. You also get some ST segment elevation that is happening in lead AVL you get some ST segment uh, elevation that is happening in lead V2, lead V3, V4, and to some extent, V5. So that's showing you an acute anterolateral myocardial infarction. Again, I shall leave a link in the description below where you could download this PowerPoint and actually look at these ECGs and take your time so that you could actually understand them. Here is an ECG of an acute in inferior infarction. Here there's a lateral ischemia. So there's a normal sinus rhythm, there's a normal axis, there's a normal curious complex on this ECG. And what we can see is that there is a raised ST segment or ST segment elevation in lead two, as we can see here, ST segment elevation in lead three, as well as lead AVF. And of course, there's an inverted T wave in lead AVL. There's also um, some inverted T waves in lead V1 over here, which is obviously normal. Thank you for taking your time to listen to this initial part on PQRST abnormalities. Until next time, my name is Moses Kazevo. Bye-bye.